So this evening, I'd like to take what Dr. Masson has just explained introductory, in an introductory fashion and talk a little bit about what perceived problems I have noticed that have been brought about by the social justice movement. Now, of course, the term social justice, at least the way it is used today, I believe is actually a true oxymoron. And the reason for that is I don't believe that it's truly social, and I don't believe that it is truly just. Justice, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, states, and I'm quoting, it refers to the quality of being just, impartial or fair, conforming to truth, fact, or reason, close quote. What we find in the application of pure and social justice today is anything but just, or impartial, or standing in conformity to truth and reason. Most social justice advocates believe that the very idea of reason, the very idea of truth, is nothing but a social construct, what Michel Foucault called simply an illusion, something that's been socially constructed that has no basis in reality. And so what we witness today in our society and Bear in mind that when we look at this issue of social justice and even cultural Marxism, it is quite interesting that this is predominantly a Western phenomenon. Uh, you don't see this type of thinking in Asia. You don't see it in Africa. Uh, you don't see it in other parts of the world. It is uniquely a Western form of thinking. And I think Dr. Masson kind of hit on that when he demonstrated that the cultural Marxist's primary target was the West not just the West, but of course the undermining of Judeo-Christian principles and the very foundations upon which Western society has been built, including the nuclear family, which is the basis and has been the basis of society for time immemorial. I think it's also important for us to realize tonight that social justice, like its counterpart cultural Marxism, is rooted in a Marxist worldview, which is also an atheistic worldview with a Marxist uh, flavor to it. And it also contains an embedded disdain and hatred for anything that is connected to Western history and civilization, including Judeo-Christian Judeo values. It proposes a view whereby Westerners have a self-loathing of their identity, particularly if you are a white, heterosexual, Christian male, especially if you have a European background. There's a self-loathing built by association that somehow uh, white, male, uh, straight Christians are uh, perpetrators of oppression and that the only way we can remedy that is if they confess, make reparations, and so forth. The most dangerous thing about this worldview is that it also rejects objective truth and meaning. As I've mentioned earlier, truth and meaning are considered uh, uh, offsprings of the Enlightenment, which they believe was simply a bunch of Western white men who were trying to use uh, reason as a form of power to control the masses. It claims, on the one hand, to promote tolerance, but the meaning of tolerance is a meaning that has clearly changed. Tolerance in its historic traditional sense referred to agreeing to disagree agreeably with someone. You could disagree with the person's views without disparaging the person. You may not agree with their idea, you may not agree with the particular views, but you don't disparage the person. Today, tolerance has been relabeled or it has been redefined as simply affirmation. There is no debate, you simply affirm the position of the other side or else you are being schismatic, you're being hateful, and in worse, you're being a Nazi. And so I think what we're seeing in our day and age is a relabeling, a redefining what George Orwell spoke of as Newspeak in his 1984, the thought crimes, groupthink, and so forth. The identity of the person is no longer central here. Of course, the whole objective of 
social justice and, of course, historic cultural Marxism, uh, as well as uh, historic Nazism as well under uh, the uh, Nazi regime, was never about the individual. It's not about the individual as a special person, as someone made in the Imago Dei, the image of God, but it was about the group, the collective. It's all about the group. It's all about the collective. Your identity is not tied to you. Your identity is tied to and defined by the group by which you associate. Now, the danger that I see today in the social justice movement, and it is frightening to the core, is that the rhetoric, the rhetoric that they are employing is the very same rhetoric that the Marxists employed under Joseph Stalin, Pol Pot, under Mao Zedong in China, under Castro in Cuba, and they all began by vilifying the other. By vilifying the other as the grand oppressor, the enemy, the bloodthirsty hucksters who have taken advantage of the oppressed and have taken from them to make themselves richer. We saw this, for example, under Stalin when he attacked the Ukraine, when he attacked particularly the kulaks, the farmers, the peasants, when he began to take over their, their farms and basically left these people to starve. Six to seven million Ukrainians lost their lives, something that is still remembered today by the Ukrainian community every year. And it was because the rhetoric was that these kulaks, these Ukrainian farmers, had taken advantage of the Russians and became rich on their backs. And none of that was true, it was pure propaganda. Mao Zedong did the same thing in China by claiming that the farmers had taken the land, and they had taken uh, power to themselves, and he incited the peasants to rise against them, and to overthrow them, and to get rid of them. Hitler did something similar in Germany. He blamed the Jews for the collapse of Germany in the First World War. He blamed the capitalists for all the woes of Germany. And Adolf Hitler himself always spoke of himself as a victim. He was a victim of the Treaty of Versailles, which uh, imposed heavy fines on Germany after the First World War. And even to the very end, when he knew that the gig was up, he claimed that he was the victim in all of this. This is quite an old story, if I could share with you. It's an old story that appears in the Bible between two brothers. Uh, the first homicide that is recorded in the Bible is that of Cain and Abel. And there you have these two brothers, and one is a shepherd, and one is a gardener or a farmer. And Abel brings a, a lamb to sacrifice before God, and God is pleased with his sacrifice. Cain brings the produce of the land as a farmer. He brings the produce of the land, and he offers it to God. God does not show regard for Cain's offering, and Cain becomes embittered against his brother Abel. He becomes so embittered, and he felt uh, that he was the victim here, that God was favoring Abel over himself. And what did that anger do? He stewed in that anger. He marinated in that, in that bitterness. And what did he do? He expressed it by murdering his brother and feeling that by getting rid of the cause of his the victim, the victimization, he would alleviate that. And of course, he ends up being questioned by God and he becomes a wanderer and so forth. And at the end, he still considered himself the enemy, the enemy of, uh, or the victim rather, of this unfair situation. And what I fear here is that the same rhetoric is being used today of vilifying the other, vilifying those who are considered conservative, those who are considered Christians, and this type of rhetoric, we've seen it already. It took the lives of hundreds of millions of people. It can happen again. We should never deceive ourselves into thinking that this will not happen. Ideas have consequences. And human history has been a testimony of the worst horrors that humans can inflict on each other. And the real problem here, I believe, is not the other. It's not playing the victim and looking for a scapegoat. Some try to blame the government for all our problems. We try to blame our universities or our schools. We try to blame religious institutions. We try to blame our family. We try to blame the patriarchy and so forth and so on. The real problem here is not the other, it is ourselves. 
Humans are broken people. And so being a Christian theologian, I cannot help but, but quote here some relevant passages. The Holy Bible says that none is righteous. No, not one. No one does good, not even one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so the problem here is that we are all part of the same human family. We are all broken people. And I'm not excusing past grievances or present grievances. I'm not excusing uh, racism. I'm not excusing forms of discrimination. I'm clearly against this. But what I'm saying here is that if we follow our family genealogies far enough, we will realize that our ancestors were not as uh, noble as we think they were. They were guilty of exactly the same things that other cultures have committed. I believe that all humans are uniquely part of a human family. I believe that human beings are precious people, they're precious uh, persons made in the image of God. You are unique, You're, there's no one like you. You're like the proverbial snowflake. There's no one like you. You've been imbued with dignity, with integrity, with human rights. And as image bearers of God, all humans without qualification are equal. No one is better or more privileged than another. You're not defined by your group identity. You are an individual with a unique right to life, liberty, and health, as the founding fathers of the United States put it. So we hear today about social progressiveness, that we're being socially progressive. But this, again, is group identity politics. Looking to the back, looking to the, to the past, and remaining in the past, and never moving forward. Because we're consumed with what's happened back there, and we're not willing to move forward together. Where do we see some of this? I see a lot of inconsistencies, really, in the social justice movement. And I know that even in the topic, like abortion, which is a hot topic uh, in universities and in society in general, I personally believe, as a theologian, that Abortion is the greatest dehumanization of unborn human people. At least 100,000 abortions are committed and performed in Canada. But what is very strange is that there is, there's a branch of, of, of abortion, if I may call it that, that they call sex selective abortions, where they clearly are getting rid of females. They've done this in countries like Pakistan, India, and China, especially under the one child rule. Uh, little girls were being aborted because they were girls. And so if we do stand up for women, as we always hear, we should stand up for women's rights, which I do, and I believe in women's rights, then are we not doing a great injustice when we have people simply <laughs> destroying babies by virtue of the fact that they are girls, that they're females? That is one of the greatest insults, I think, to women's rights. What about racial tensions? Well, we've been hearing a lot about group identity, and what this group identity thinking does is it creates tribalism. It's a form of tribalism when we have all these little tribes. And what it does is it, it inevitably pits various ethnic groups against each other. And we're back into that old Marxist paradigm of the oppressor versus the oppressed. It's the, it's the bourgeois against the proletariat again. And we see this especially in the area of white privilege, where, where white folks, white Caucasian males or females, especially males, are felt, or they feel that somehow their whiteness has, has given them advantages that others do not have. And I think that, that that is a false construct. I'm going to get back to that. Let me just say from the start that I reject the idea of races. I don't believe that there are races. I don't believe there's a black race. I don't believe there's an Asian race. I don't believe that there is a, a white race. I believe there's only one race, and that is the human race. And I believe that within that human race, there is diversity, obviously, of language, there's cultural traditions, but at the end of the day, all human beings share the same, the same length. We are all part of the same human family. I remember, if you think of Martin Luther King's great I Have a Dream address in Washington, D.C., which he delivered in 1963. And he made this incredible statement. He spoke of a day when his children, quote, will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, close quote. That people should not be judged by 
their skin color, but they should be judged by the content of their character. What I see today in the social justice movement is the exact opposite of Martin Luther King's dream, or rather a return to the very things that Martin Luther King fought against. Skin color has again become the dominant theme of today. The horrible racist Jim Crow laws of racial segregation that exist in the United States have reared their ugly head again. Although not enforced, they are welcomed primarily by those who are leftists in their political leanings. For example, the University of Toronto gave its official blessing and taxpayer dollars for a black student's only graduation in 2017. In the United States, the National Association of Scholars looked at 173 schools and found that 76 of them, or about 44%, offered these ceremonies. And these range from small private schools to big public universities. Some of the notable schools that have these black-only graduation ceremonies, Harvard, UC San Diego, UC Irvine, Arizona, uh, Arizona State University, Stanford, UC Berkeley, UCLA, and Yale. Now, what I'm saying here is that as long as we keep perpetuating this segregation, which is the very thing that Martin Luther King was trying to get rid of. He looked at the day when whites and blacks and red and yellow would come together and hold hands as one human family. But what we're seeing now is a return to this segregation. And what astounds me is that it is the leftists who are actually championing this and saying, uh, yes, let them have their own graduation ceremony. That, that's simply up to them. You may have seen just recently on Twitter, uh, February 12th, a video was posted where an African-American student at the University of Virginia was complaining that there were too many white people in the new multicultural student center. And she said, and I quote, Frank, frankly, there's just too many white people in here, and this is a space for people of color, close quote. Another example was seen in April of 2017 when Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington had a no white state and asked all Caucasians to voluntarily remain off campus. Now folks, racism by any other name is still racism. No matter what skin color someone has, no one has the right to discriminate on someone's skin color. But for some strange reason in our society, it seems to be perfectly acceptable to do this. This type of thinking is not progressive by any means. It is destructive and regressive. We often hear as well about cultural enrichment. All cultures are equal. But this mantra is not only false, it's hypocritical. All cultures are equal, except when it comes to the West. Notwithstanding the major contributions and advancements of Western uh, civilization in the fields of philosophy, science, medicine, technology, we can go on and talk about the Industrial Revolution. We can talk about the Enlightenment. We can talk about discoveries in medicine and so forth. You'll notice that notwithstanding all of these achievements, the West is constantly vilified for its colonialism, for the slave trade, for the Crusades. And what is interesting is that no one cares to stop and think for a moment that it was the West that was the first to abolish slavery, particularly in England with William Wilberforce. And then in the United States, Americans were killing each other in 1865 because of Abraham Lincoln's act of emancipation that he wanted to push through to liberate the blacks in the South. Think about that. The West was the first to abolish slavery. Even Robespierre, after the French Revolution in 1789, he moved to abolish slavery in France. And then Napoleon Bonaparte, when he came to power in 1802, he reestablished slavery. And then later on, when Napoleon was deposed, it was, again, abolished. So let's think of a couple of things here. We think of slave trade. What we hear about the slave trade is always the Atlantic slave trade. But you'll notice that no one speaks about the Eastern slave trade. No one talks about the Islamic slave trade that happened centuries before the Atlantic slave trade where many blacks were taken captive as slaves. The, the men were usually uh, castrated, and the women were taken as concubines. Many of these slaves died in transit to Arabia. No one talks
talks about the Barbary pirates, the Muslims in North Africa who took on pirate ships and went to the coasts of England and took white Europeans, took them back to North Africa, sold them to slavery. They invaded the coast of Spain, France, Portugal, the Portuguese island of Madeira, took them as slaves into slavery, one folks, long before the Atlantic slave trade took place. But no one talks about this today because this is not the narrative that Western academia wants to talk about. Even though this is well documented, slavery still exists today. Countries like Libya, Mauritania still has it, even though on the books they've abolished slavery, it still continues today. The Aboriginal peoples of this country owned slaves. They raided one another's tribes. They raped one another's wives. Some of them were cannibals. The Aztecs would take their slaves and offer them up to the sun god, would open their chests and take their clean heart and offering it to the sun god. They also engaged in cannibalism. Just last year in the country of Peru, archaeologists discovered 250 skeletal remains of children that were killed and buried to avoid a hurricane that was heading towards Peru and they prayed, of course, to their uh, the weather god, the god of the climate, and so forth, and they sacrificed 250 children. They also were patriarchal, by the way. The First Nations people of our country and in the United States were patriarchal. They practiced the form of patriarchy. But we don't hear about this today. And why is that? Because it doesn't fit the narrative. And we as academics must ask the question, why? Why is this not mentioned? We hear a lot about colonialism. And yes, we hear about the British colonizing, the French colonized, so forth and so on. And we never talk about, of course, the Islamic conquests. After 632 AD, when the prophet of Islam died, Muhammad, the Islamic armies went forth out of Arabia, took over all of Persia, they took over the Middle East, they took over all of North Africa, and they went as far as uh, Andalusia, which is modern-day Spain, and parts of Portugal. And when they came to these countries, they would colonize them. And how would they colonize them? They Arabicized that culture. People took on Arabic names. That's why many uh, Muslims in North Africa, they may have an African background, but they have uh, Arabic names, and they pray in Arabic, and so forth. These are all forms of colonization. But no one talks about that. And my point is this. Why? Because I believe that there's an agenda at work, and the agenda is to tear down Western civilization, to undermine Western civilization, the very civilization that gave us the university, that gave us the right to academic speech, to free speech, that came up with the Magna Carta, that came up with the Great Declaration of Independence, which came up with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and so forth, formerly known as the British North America Act. And so I believe that the the fruits of this worldview, and, and it all is a worldview, isn't it? We all have a worldview. We all have a point of beginning, a paradigm through which we interpret reality. And I think that this movement has been devastating. And my concern is that, and I pray that this does not result in the errors of yesteryear, where we saw this type of thinking produce some of the greatest horrors that this world has ever seen. I'm going to leave you with the words of the famous Spanish philosopher, Santayana, who said this, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. May that not be true of us today. <laughs>